Up the mountains, chugging through the fails, go the gallant little railway lines of Wales. The firebox glows, the pistons gleam, the engines puffing celestial steam. Once you hear that heavenly sound, you know you're safely just in your bound. And the land of my fathers looks twice as fine when you see it from the carriage of a railway line. And here is the track of the Festiniog Railway, starting at Porth Maddock on the west coast of North Wales, in through one of the wildest parts of Snowdonia, towards the great quarries of Blaenau Festiniog. Porth Maddock with Snowdon itself in the background, and the little port which was the original cause of the railway being built. In the old days, the harbour was crowded with sailing ships, taking the slate out to London and Lancashire. And now, the new holiday hideouts for yachtsmen, replacing the old slate sheds. And behind them, the old station, solid, four-square and slate roofed, of course, and now one of the great tourist attractions of Wales. The engines are irresistible. This double fairly locomotive was built in 1879, a sort of double-ended push-me-pull-me affair. It must be one of the most photographed engines in the whole of Britain. And the line has got two of them. Nearly a hundred years old and still going strong. Well, no wonder the railway is patting the tourists in. The ticket office, manned by the senior mathematics master of Winchester College. Who turns the trip to the cabins? No, no seats left, I'm afraid. No, seats no not for today, no. Sorry. Calling at Penrith and the first section of the line, with the train hauled by the gallant Blanche, now an oil-fired engine, bought in 1962 from the old Penryn Railway. Out of the famous embankment called the Cobb, built across the Glaslyn estuary in 1811 by the enterprising Mr. Maddox, the MP for Boston, and he even got the poet Shelley to put money into it. Inland, the winding Glaslyn, and the marshland alive with wild birds. To the west, the sandbanks and the sea, and the train curving around past Boston Lodge, the railway workshop, and where those remarkable double fairly engines were actually built. The line here swings inland and alongside the main road. This is where most visitors first see it, a little envious of its freedom of movement perhaps, as they sit stuck in a queue on the road, waiting to pay their toll to cross the cob. No Welsh line is complete without a passing view of a cemetery, all headstones guaranteed of slate transported on the old Festiniog Railway. The railway here is running on comparatively level ground. The big hills are still ahead. And the first station is Minfarth. The oil-fired boilers allow these engines to stay remarkably clean. I was looking forward to getting out at Minford because I knew that waiting for me on the platform would be one of the most remarkable men I know. He's 92, older than most of the engines on the line, but still as full of energy as they are. Sir Clough Williams Ellis, architect extraordinary and the only talking national monument in Wales. Oh, <laughs> Welcome to, your, <laughs> to my home state. <laughs> 
and Minforth is Sir Clough's home station because not far away is his marvellous fantasy village of Port Myrion. Port Myrion is now world famous and no one but Sir Clough would have dared to place what looks like a military Italian hill town along the sands of the Doirid estuary against the rainy mountains of North Wales. And it was raining by the time Sir Clough and I walked down the elegant central piazza, talking of how Sir Clough had first conceived this delightful 18th century type folly on a grand scale. But where did you find the buildings? I mean, you, you, you didn't know that you were going to get these lovely collection of all sorts ah, of Ah, well, those, are, the, those are only uh, additions, really, to what I'd planned. Uh, mm. And uh, the whole secret of it is, I think, why it looks different to most places is that it was done step by step, mm. had to be, because I couldn't <laughs> afford to do it otherwise. <laughs> And I'd put uh, uh, what I'd consider a master mm. building at mm. one point and then gradually mm. work towards mm. it. But you were a sort of architectural magpie. You went hopping around the country, picking up things here, picking up things there, and making a lovely <laughs> nest of it in Port Myron. Well, it wasn't so much picking up <laughs> as having them thrown at me. A lot of them I had to refuse. Mm. I mean, things, absurd things like, oh, you snatch <laughs> London Bridge. <laughs> well, you couldn't have put London Bridge here across the estuary, perhaps. No, well, you see, I had to be very careful about mm. scale because the whole place is, mm. is miniature. Mm. And I had to stick to that scale. And what I did was to make a few, uh, what you might call, uh, marking points. Like the Campanile went up very early to show that I was doing something. You were in here, business, yes. And doing something mm. rather different mm -hmm. to the ordinary. Yeah. Because I remember seeing that from the other side of the estuary, almost as in the early days, when and wondering was, what on earth that this was doing well, in non-conformist Wales. I mean, that was what you were meant to feel, <laughs> <laughs> what everybody was meant to feel, and did. And of course, it uh, the news spread. But I am offered, you see, you remember in the 18th century, mm. where establishments called Homes for Fallen <laughs> Women, and I let it be known that I'd established one for fallen buildings, <laughs> which I was interested in. And I have all sorts of... Last offer was the most absurd, I think, quite recently, was one of, <laughs> one of um, uh, underground shell grotto in Sussex. Well, how the hell <laughs> one is supposed to move that? I don't move know. the ground as well. Yeah. But uh, this sort of thing couldn't have happened except in the way it did, which was gradually. I'd build one thing and then, well, what was required or what I had an urge to build and then I'd build that and then what would fit in. Not a thing you could have done on a drawing board and with a general contractor. See, I had my yeah. own works department. You never thought of getting a little branch of the railway here, did you? Clap well, I did, branch. but <laughs> that would have been very nice. But. Uh, when I was ready for the railway, the mm. railway was dead. You see, it lay dead for, what, 10 or 12 years? But your, your grandfather ran it at one time, at least was the chairman, wasn't he? Well, my uncle. Oh, your uncle. My mm. uncle Dick Graves, oh, mm. yes. Mm. And, um, you see, he, it was hard times because the railway, poor little railway, never fully recovered, I think, from uh, uh, delusions of grandeur mm. and uh, going passenger not realising that the requirements of the uh, Board of Trade would require all sorts of signalling and safety yeah. devices and all the rest of it. And uh, it was in such a poor way that I remember his triumph, <laughs> when he was chairman, of extracting for one year, and one year only, one half percent for the dementia holders. <laughs> it, sounds <laughs> like never again. it sounds like shares <laughs> today. Only. But, but he got something in it out of himself, didn't he? Didn't he get oh, a free oh, pass? Yes. Oh, yes, he was pretty shrewd mm. over that. And he presented the chairman of the Great Western Railway and the uh, North, mm. London North Western Railway, which served pretty well the whole of England, really, with little badges entitling them to first-class travel on his system, which is about 10 miles long, <laughs> uh, first-class mm. for life. And, of course, they couldn't do otherwise than do the same in reverse with little gold medals. And he lived to be 92, travelling everywhere for nothing. What a <laughs> glorious man! He was. He's my favourite uncle.
called Penryn Daigrai Station, or Penryn Station, they call it. And this is the point where most travellers by road see the little train because it goes right across the road. Careful, care taken, of course, to make certain of safety precautions. <laughs> Now, the Festinjong Railway is no Will Hay affair. It's a highly professional private company, which has made the line pay by top-level management. Although it does recruit staff from some surprising areas. Mr John Gibbons was once a preparatory school headmaster. He's now the station master and everything else at Minforth. He gave me the lowdown on the safety rules of getting the train as far as the signalman at Penryn. Right, now the first thing that'll happen is that um, he will give me out of section for the train that's arrived there. Right, the ride's there. Now, I want to send him another train, so the code for that is 3-1, which he will reply to. Now, he holds it down He says I can get the staff out. Goes back to there, I can give him one, tell him I've got the staff. Now, the driver's got to be in the possession of this before he goes into the single line, uh, so that you can only get one staff out of the machine at a time. There's uh, two staff uh, machines in this section, that one to Port Maddock, that one to Penryn. Uh, this is the Penryn staff. When the train comes in from Port Maddock, he will give me the other one, and I will put it into that machine, and I will pass this one on to him. He takes it with him on his engine, up the line to Penryn, and exactly the same thing happens at the next station. A master of signals, but also the great Pooh Bar of Minforth, in charge of every other job. Well, the chief one, I suppose, is booking the tickets. I do our tickets and the British Rail tickets for the station down below. Wednesdays is dustbin day. I clear all that up. Um, and when trains cross here, I have two trains in the station at once, there's an awful lot of litter to pick up. They delight in throwing it out of the window. Then there's the staff loo across the way. I have to keep that clean. I've been brushing the courtyard. I mean, you name it, I do it. Uh, anything you like. Well, not only anything you like, but what he likes doing as well. And who wouldn't enjoy working on a railway going through scenery like this? Now the line is really starting to climb, up to Tannerbulch, about the halfway mark. You can't help marvelling at the skill with which the early engineers marked out the gradient. Of course, when the line first opened in 1832, they didn't have steam power. The builders had to make a gradient that could be used by the horses, which pulled the empties back up to Bliner, and the horses rode down again in special dandy wagons, attached to the back of the trains. And the dandy wagons of today, you'll meet them on Sunday. Now, this part of North Wales, as every visitor knows, a little ruefully, is dry. But you can drink by law on a moving train, and a certain band of happy passengers go up and down the line on Sundays like Jerusalem bees in a bottle, the most constant patrons of the Festinjog Railway. Below them is the beautiful, swan-enchanted little lake of Llynmaer. And the line makes a huge curve around it, with an inner curve known as Whistling Curve, where it turns through 180 degrees. Flenmire is a great place for breeding birds, especially in the early summer. Hannibalch has everything an old-style station ought to have. The right advertisements. Use Pegler's superior steam valves. If you're thinking of running a steam engine in your back garden, none other genuine. And the word for steam in every language. Although, where do you take tickets for a WAP train? At Tannerbulch, of course, there ought to be the Welsh word for steam, agar, as well. But at Tannerbulch, the up and down trains pass. And here the engines take on water for some of the steeper gradients that lie ahead. One popular feature of Tannerbulch station is now missing. Mrs. Bessie Jones, who for 40 years was the station mistress and always dressed in Welsh national costume, has retired. For the first 10 years after the line reopened, Tannerbulch was the terminus. But now there's a further section, which takes you up to the Yacht. 
And beyond that again, the great plan for the near future. A terminus actually at Blyneye for Stignol. Leaving Tannabull Station. And it's a pleasure now to transfer myself to the engine cab itself. Everything's gleaming, Mr. Derek Evans, the driver's got his hands on the regulator. But my first impression is one of absolutely glittering cleanliness. You'd, you'd be surprised, the brasswork on the firebox and what they call the fountain up above it, and on the steam brake, everything glitters, gladdening the heart of a railway enthusiast. Now comes the sort of section that gives a unique flavour to these little lines of Wales. The train hangs by its eyebrows on the ledge of a plunging precipice. The high embankment of vast dry walls supports the track across the clefts of the wild hillside. You know, the old craftsmen who built these embankments were the same men who built the astonishing lines of sheep walls right across the mountains of Wales. Garden and Tunnel. In the days of the horses, the track went round the risky outside. But passengers had to be taken safely into a 60-yard tunnel to emerge to a superb view over the Vale of Mainturog, far below. There are strange sights ahead, scattered over the treeless slopes of the mountains. Traitor's Cottage. It once belonged to the distinguished musician Sir Granville Bantock, and I remember staying there with my father. But then to Coy de Blaviae came William Joyce, Lord Haw-Haw, and later Kim Philby's father came here. But I remember it as no traitor's nest, but a rare country delight lost in the lonely hills. Coy de Blaviae in Welsh means the wood of the wolves, a name that takes one back to the dark ages when there were wolves still in Wales, but they've long since disappeared. The railway now is 500 feet above the bottom of the river valley. As you go higher into the hills, the views become more astonishing. It's hard to think that this line ever got into difficulties. You'd have thought that the tourists would have flocked to it. But that was an idea 50 years before its time. Other railways got to Blyna and gave a quicker outlet for the slate. Porth Maddock was too small a harbour for the new steam vessels. But then, after the collapse, after the Second World War, came the act of faith by the railway enthusiasts. The Festiniog rides again, puffing its way into another strange landmark high on the hills. The ancient manor house of a Theast, the black hillside, tucked away among those trees. Colonel and Mrs. Campbell live there, and until recently, the railway was the only way they could get to their Tudor manor house. Well, we've just dropped Mrs. Campbell off at Campbell's platform, and now here we go for the last quarter of a mile, the final run to Diaz Station. Diaz platform, and this is as far as we go, for the moment. But there are big plans ahead, and we are going to get out now and have a look at them, because the motto is back.
to blind her as soon as possible. <laughs> Thank you, Stephen. The Aff station is high up on the wild mountain side of Moywin Mawr. And there are severe problems still ahead before the railway can get back into Blaenau Festiniog. The volunteers are hard at work in it. And they've built a wide sweeping circle to get the line up 35 feet. The deviationists, they call themselves, since the route of the old line has been drowned under the waters of the new power scheme coming down from Llinstulan, and a deviation of the route had to be created higher up. Around the waters of the lower lake of the power scheme, Llinastradae. And at the moment, here is as far as the gallant deviationists have got. But here is the actual journey's end, Blaenau Festiniog, an unique view, not only from a helicopter, but on a day when it wasn't raining. Well, Blinder is high in the hills, and it owes its birth to the slate quarries. And the little line will eventually come to link up with one of the greatest of them all, Llechwedd. I'm sitting on a very tiny proportion of the 20 million tons of waste that have been scattered over the mountainsides of Blinder for Stinyog since the Llechwedd quarry first opened in 1846. And incidentally, honeycombed the mountain with caves in it, rather like a, a giant cheese inside. And believe it or not, these quarries have now become one of Wales's major tourist attractions. The owners of Llechwedd realised that the huge underground caves were a tremendous thrill. They must be one of the most extraordinary collections of man-made caverns in Europe. And the tourist arrangements have won an award for the most enterprising attraction in Britain. Well, here we go in another little train with the roof specially fitted to protect the tourists, because we're going through a whole series of long tunnels deep into the very heart of the mountain. Well, I've come into one of the caverns and to show the visitors how the thing worked, they've got models, effigies of the workmen themselves and what a job they had. You can see how tough it was handling these huge slabs of slate and all they had to work by was candlelight and very often they had to buy the candle themselves. And besides me is the manager the, of the underground quarry, a model manager too, he's the chap with the money. And by the way, men got the princely sum before the war of eight and fourpence a day. And then high up, right on the very summit, it almost seems, of this huge cave, he must be at least 40 feet up, there's the rockman. He was the man who brought down the huge chunks of rock and he worked with a chain, with a half hitch round his middle and a, again this tiny candlelight and the daring of it, the, the risks of it, well, you've just got to take your hats off when you see them to the men who made the slate of Blinefest in Yard. And to the men who built the railway. And to the men who are now keeping it going as one of the greatest of the gallant little lines of Wales. up the mountains, chugging through the vales, go the gallant little railway lines of Wales. The firebox glows, the pistons gleam, the engines puffing celestial steam. Once you hear that heavenly sound, you know you're safely just in your bound. And the land of my fathers looks twice as fine when you see it from the carriage of a railway line. <laughs> 